Hello aviators, Sky here, and we are returning to the world of flying predators. The first in this marathon was the F-14 Tomcat, and if it can be considered the first fourth generation fighter, then our today's hero without a doubt can be considered the official father of all those hunters that still rule the sky over the conflict regions. The F-15 Eagle is a multi-role jet fighter developed by McDonnell Douglas in the early 1970s. Manufactured in the amount of about 1200 units in many modifications, the F-15 is one of the main US Air Force combat aircraft, is still being produced by Boeing, and only now is slowly giving way to its heirs, lightnings and dinosaurs of the fifth generation. Despite all the epic success, the history of this aircraft began with an era of loud but long and painfully boring disputes. The first concept studies of creating a new fighter's generation began in the 1950s. However, a significant complication of fighters was already becoming a problem at that time, and the Pentagon, trying to reduce the cost of creating new equipment, came to the conclusion that there was a need for deep unification, meaning the creation of a single fighter, modifications of which will serve primarily in the Air Force and the Navy. Tactical Fighter Experimental, or the TFX program, was initiated. In 1964, the new F-111, which was to become this single fighter, made its first flight. However, both branches of the military were not happy with it, as well as with the whole TFX concept. An attempt to create a universal machine solved a number of problems for the Pentagon, but such machines could not satisfy the requirements that were too different. Eventually, the US Navy initiated its own program, the result of which was the F-14 Tomcat. The US Air Force accepted the F-111, since the aircraft promised to become a fairly efficient multi-purpose fighter. However, with its performance it turned out to be an excellent tactical bomber, but in the missions to gain air superiority it was not so good. In 1965 the Air Force initiated its own program, which included the creation of a fighter that was cheaper and lighter than the F-111, designed to gain superiority in air and, in a limited extent, fulfill the functions of an attack aircraft. It was impossible to make a universal aircraft for all military branches, but at least for one they could try. The Air Force had too many different machines, and even the Pentagon didn't have the money to replace them all. After several months of debates, it was decided that the future fighter would be based on the Northrop F-5. Of course it wasn't very tough, but it was possible to create the right machines quickly and cheaply on its basis. By October 1965, aircraft manufacturers finally received an official request and terms of reference for the FX project. The research involved more than 10 companies, developing about 500 initial concepts. But their vision was old. In most designs, the legacy of the TFX program was obvious. The proposed fighters, one way or another, were just simplified versions of the F-111. The Vietnam War presented even more questions. The original concept of the US Air Force was the use of high-speed fighters attacking the enemy with the latest missiles over long distances. The root of this concept was the critical need to provide protection from Soviet bombers, carriers of nuclear weapons. However, in real life, instead of bombers, the Americans were met by fighters, constantly forcing them into dogfights, the result of which were not as rosy as the Pentagon would like. The development of a new concept began, which was accompanied by wild debate and scandals. Here, a group of military officers and experts got involved, to which the press even gave a nickname, the Fighter Mafia. They frankly stated that the military industry got carried away with high technology, that super planes are only cool on paper, but in reality the only thing they destroy is taxpayer money, and that aviation doesn't need all those computerized universal fighters with super locators, uber missiles and trans wings, but instead a simple and maneuverable combat aircraft, capable of fighting normally in close combat, without disgracing the Air Force with casualty reports. There was logic in these words. Airplanes were getting more and more complicated, and many solutions were interesting from the point of view of technologies, but in practice turned out to be ineffective. A new stage of research according to a new concept was launched. Now the fighter was supposed to fly at Mach 2.5 instead of 3, and its thrust to weight ratio increased from 0.75 to 1. The aircraft was supposed to be more effective in close combat, but at the same time it was decided to preserve the ability to attack ground targets, albeit in a limited manner. Now it seemed the work had finally begun, but then another surprise came from the USSR. 
In 1967, at the Moscow Aviation Parade, among the many familiar vehicles, the new MiG-25 first appeared. The disputes started all over again. The FX was planned as a universal fighter, capable of engaging maneuverable vehicles, such as the MiG-21 for example. But suddenly this Mach 3 interceptor with new missiles appeared. So what are you gonna do now? There was not a lot of choice. In 1968, versatility was abandoned, and the future aircraft was to become a pure fighter for air superiority, something like a simplified F-14 for the Air Force. The official tender was attended by Fairchild Republic, North American Rockwell and McDonnell Douglas. The concepts of the three companies were significantly different from each other, and were a demonstration of vision of the future aviation. Fairchild introduced a swept-wing aircraft, with two engines located in separate nacelles. This scheme was somewhat close to the F-14, in which the engines were also placed apart, creating quite a large fuselage. But here they probably went too far. Such a design increased the dimensions of the aircraft and had problems with controllability. The North American project had the most complicated design at the time. Their fighter incorporated the best aerodynamic solutions that the company had developed on the XB-70 Valkyrie. It had a highly developed integrated airframe with an ogival wing that flows smoothly into the fuselage. The air intakes located under the fuselage were also integrated, and the engines were located inside the rear section. Thus, the plane was the most promising of all proposed, but the risks were also big. No one could guarantee there wouldn't be any problems with it. In the end, the Air Force chose the McDonnell Douglas Compromise version. Their aircraft had a more classic design. The decisions made on it were not revolutionary, but they completely satisfied the military with acceptable technical risks. Many solutions had already been worked out during the creation of the F-14. Besides, the MiG-25, with similar design, seemed like a cool airplane. The F-15 became the official project of McDonnell Douglas. It was planned to create two basic aircraft, a single-seat F-15 and a double-seat TF-15. Later, they were renamed F-15A and F-15B. The work was carried out quite fast. The third-generation fighters were already obsolete, and the Air Force needed a new plane as soon as possible. Let's see what kind of plane they were working on. The F-15 fighter is made according to the scheme of high trapezoid wing, two engines inside the fuselage, and a twin vertical stabilizer empennage, by modern standards classic. Meanwhile the plane is mostly metal, about 26-27% to of titanium and about 5-7% to of composites, plus an active use of honeycomb structures. The wing was equipped with ailerons and flaps. A large aerodynamic brake was located in the upper part of the fuselage, behind the cockpit. What's interesting is that in the rear of the fuselage, near the nozzles, there is a landing hook. This is a simplified version of the hooks of naval planes, and of course is not applied regularly. It is needed for emergency situations, when the plane, let's say, needs help to stop faster. The tail is represented by two vertical stabilizers and two all-moving horizontal consoles. They were installed just below the wing plane, and after a series of tests were modified by adding a little dog tooth at the leading edge. This solution increased the surface efficiency and reduced the risks of flutter at high speeds. Despite the lack of revolutionary solutions, the airframe was considered very advanced and in the future confirmed its high performance. During the operation of the F-15, there were several incidents when, after collision, significant parts of the plane's aerodynamic surfaces were damaged to the point of losing entire wing consoles, and even then they could still successfully perform emergency landings. The landing gear has three legs of a classic scheme, each leg has one wheel. The design and layout allowed the main gear to be pretty compact and take up little space in the fuselage, although the price of this was the relatively narrow track, which slightly increased the risk of tipping over, especially during the strong crosswind landings. Power plant, two Pratt Whitney F100 series turbofan engines with afterburners. This pair created enough thrust to meet the requirements of the military, the thrust-to-weight ratio was slightly bigger than 1, and the maximum speed reached Mach 2.5. The engines are located in pair in the rear of the fuselage and equipped with individual adjustable air intakes installed on the sides of the fuselage. However, such a compact arrangement of engines and adjacent empennage elements complicated the work of classic nozzle with turkey feathers, like on many modern fighters. Instead, new adjustable nozzles were created. They were more compact. 
The new engines and all their main systems were combined into a single structure, which greatly simplified their maintenance and replacement. This was one of the important requirements in the creation of both the engines and the aircraft as a whole. Despite the significant purchase price of the F-15, its life cycle turned out to be not that expensive. Unlike the double-seat F-4 and F-14, the basic F-15 was a single-seat interceptor, which meant more work for the pilot, so he needed some help. To increase visibility, the cockpit was raised and received a new, fairly wide one-piece windscreen. The aircraft received a complete set of the latest onboard systems, communications, controls and weapons. The F-15 was equipped with an AN-APG-63 family Doppler radar created by Hughes Aircraft, which is now a part of Raytheon. In conjunction with an onboard computer, it could work both at great distances and in close combat. Being the main fighter of the Air Force, the F-15 was able to carry a wide scale of weapons. The main weapons of the fighter are the short-range AIM-9 Sidewinder, medium-range AIM-7 Sparrow and long-range AIM-120 AMRAAM missiles. Initially, adaptation of the AIM-54 Phoenix missile was planned, an obvious solution, but it was too complicated and expensive, so it remained exclusive to the F-14. In total, the plane received 11 hardpoints, quite a lot for a not-so-big jet. However, not all of them are used every time. It is worth noting here that gorgeous photos with fighters decorated by missiles and bombs like Christmas trees are more of an advertisement. In real conditions, so many weapons are not required, only standard sets of missiles plus hanging fuel tanks, if necessary. The main gift for the close air combat was the already classic 20mm M61 Vulcan. The gun was placed inside the wing route, to the right from the cockpit. The space on the other side was used by the refueling system. So, all this beauty was officially born in 1972. In July, the single-seat F-15A made its first flight, and a year later, in July of 1973, the twin-seat F-15B. The Air Force was pleased with the new aircraft. Criticism, of course, also fell on it. The F-15 still seemed complicated, and its cost was very immodest, several times higher than that of the F-4. Critics were reassured only after some time. The F-16 and F-A-18 managed to calm them down. Deliveries of serious fighters began in the fall of 1974 with the transfer of the two-seat combat training F-15Bs, and they received combat readiness status in 1976. The aircraft showed excellent performance, and the pilots considered it the best in the world. In general, it was, at least until the birth of the Su-27. Soon, the rate of production was increased, and the US Air Force began receiving hundreds of fighters of the basic and upgraded versions. The first foreign operator of the F-15 was Israel, the deliveries to which started in 1976. Israel was the first country to use these aircraft in combat. In the late 1970s, their planes liked getting into fights with the Syrian MiG-21, and later with the bosses, MiG-25. The statistics of battles, of course, are different on each side. But the F-15 gave solace to Tel Aviv. Their old fighters could not do anything against the high-speed and high-altitude MiG-25. The Israel Air Force is armed with about 80 fighters of various versions. Almost immediately after the start of supplies, following the comments of the military, McDonnell Douglas initiated a program to improve the fighters. The result of their work was a pair of F-15C and F-15D, upgraded versions of the F-15A and B respectively. The new aircraft received an increased maximum takeoff mass, a reinforced landing gear, additional internal fuel capacity, and the possibility of optional use of conformal fuel tanks, installed next to the air intake channels. Electronics were also updated. The radar and onboard computer became more efficient and could be adapted to more specific tasks, which was very useful. The upgraded fighter jets became the base of the fleet of the largest foreign operator, Japan. Back in 1975, the Japanese experts were watching the new fighter and planned to buy it to replace the aging F-104J and F-4EJ. Already in 1978, an agreement was signed on the supply and deployment of local production of fighters in Japan. The Land of the Rising Sun wanted about 220 aircraft of the F-15J and DJ versions, of which the first couple of dozen arrived from the United States and the rest were assembled by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. In 2018, approximately 155 F-15J and 45 F-15DJ served in the Japanese Self-Defense Forces. 
A few years later, Saudi Arabia also joined the list of the F-15 operators, receiving a batch of more than 60 F-15 Sea Fighters. In 2018, most of their fleet was in operation, and the Royal Saudi Arabian Air Force is still receiving new supplies of the F-15S and SA, in total more than 100 units. The next big stage in development of the fighter was the revival of the universality idea. In the late 1970s, the F-111 was already becoming irrelevant. It was too complex and expensive, and its effectiveness was quite relative. They were not going to create something from scratch, so the Air Force announced a competition to create a bomber version of an existing aircraft. The fighter bombers F-15E and F-16XL became competitors. The obvious winner by 1984 was the F-15E, since the F-16 was originally created as a light fighter, and the creation of a bomber based on it was a difficult task, requiring serious changes in the airframe. Meanwhile, the new McDonnell Douglas aircraft, created on the basis of the two-seat F-15D, was of course remastered and received equipment for the use of air-to-ground weapons, but nevertheless did not require large-scale changes in the design. Soon, the F-15E Strike Eagle became the main US Air Force fighter bomber. The bonus was that the new program made it possible to develop new solutions that later transferred to the basic fighters. The F-15C and D received new onboard equipment and the updated digitally controlled F-100 PW220 engines, more powerful, reliable and economical. The victory parade of the F-15 was interrupted on the seashore. McDonnell Douglas developed the F-15N Sea Eagle project, which was supposed to be a simpler alternative to the F-14 Tomcat. However, not having a sufficiently powerful radar nor the ability to use the AIM-54 Phoenix missiles, it was not interesting. A more advanced version of the F-15N PHX was created, but it, having performance similar to the F-14, turned out to be no less complicated and expensive. The Eagle never conquered the aircraft carriers. Nevertheless, the F-15 turned out to be much more universal than originally conceived. In addition to the military use, the aircraft inspired great passion for aviators to conduct diverse tests. New fighter equipment, technological solutions, power plants and tactical concepts were tested on them. One of the most interesting experimental options was the F-15 STOL MTD, Short Takeoff and Landing Maneuver Technology Demonstrator. Back in the mid-1970s, the Air Force and NASA began early research on a number of promising technologies that could significantly increase maneuverability and reduce runway length. In 1984, on the basis of one of the TF-15 prototypes, McDonnell Douglas created a flying lab to test these solutions. The aircraft received special airborne systems, flat nozzles capable of turning the thrust vector up to 20 degrees up and down, as well as a rather large canard, which in fact was transferred from the FA-18 tail, almost without modifications. The flight tests conducted since 1988 showed absolutely stunning performance of the new plane. The takeoff distance was reduced by 25%. The landing distance was reduced to only 500 meters, or 1600 feet with the usual indicator of more than 2.3 kilometers, or 7,500 feet. And in the air, plane could maintain control at minimum speeds and in an almost upright position. A smart aerobatic toy. Eventually, the entire project was transferred to NASA that, as part of the program ACTIVE, Advanced Control Technology for Integrated Vehicles, explored new ways to increase controllability, and the nozzles with two-dimensional thrust vectoring gave way to the new ones with full 3D vectoring. Some parts of this development were never used, but some were applied in the creation of other aircraft. The F-15, meanwhile, continues to participate in diverse trials, primarily in the park of NASA. Another unusual project was the work to create an anti-satellite complex, in which the F-15 acted as a flying launch platform for the ASM-135 ASAT missile. From 1984 to 1986, two modified fighters conducted test launches from an almost vertical position, at a speed of Mach 1.22 and an altitude of about 11 to 12 kilometers, or 38,000 feet. In the course of one of the tests, a target appeared, a decommissioned satellite on low Earth orbit. The satellite was successfully destroyed. After confirming the concept's potential, the work was stopped. But now we can safely say that a fairly average by modern standards fighter with a fairly average by modern standards missile is capable of knocking down most low-orbit vehicles, including space stations. 
ominous silence. From the early 1980s to the early 2000s, the F-15 was in fact the main combat aircraft of the US Air Force. Made in the amount of about 1200 units, it is one of the most mass-produced fourth generation fighters and is involved in most military conflicts in the world. Israel has been actively using them from the moment they were received. The United States has been using them in all its military campaigns and, more recently, the F-15 began to be actively used by Saudi Arabia. The only fighters not involved in big fights are Japanese. At the same time, the statistics of victories and losses, although demonstrating the clear advantage of the F-15, can hardly be considered representative, since these fighters most often enter the battle in conditions of almost absolute superiority over the enemy. But their time is slowly coming to an end. In 2009, the first A and B generation retired, giving way to the new flagship, the F-22 Raptor. Most of the C and D fighter models were modernized and served in the National Guard and in foreign bases. The most advanced F-15E Strike Eagle fighters continue to fly actively. They are planned to serve until the 2030s. Trying to maintain competition with the fifth generation fighter from Lockheed Martin, Boeing, that has merged with McDonnell Douglas, is developing new versions of the F-15 with new solutions, including stealth, as well as the promising version of the F-15 2040C, which is offered as a cheaper addition to the F-22, but doesn't see much demand from the Air Force yet. Boeing plans to continue the production of fighters at least until 2022, which means that the F-15 will last on the production line for as long as 50 years. So long live the king. And that's all for today. The video is long, but such is our today's hero. We can talk about it for hours. And for this, YouTube gave us the comments under the video. Like and subscribe to the channel. Fast flights and soft landings to you.